in this lecture, I'd like to dive deeper into uh, what Krieging is, how we do it in R, uh, and, and some, how do we kind of generalize uh, the Krieging approaches. So as a reminder, uh, Krieging is uh, the idea of, of doing a spatial interpolation, kind of filling in a map of, of values, uh, using the spatial autocorrelation function as a way of weighting points uh, in, a, in a kind of distance-weighted approach. And as noted in, in the last lecture, uh, you know, we're using that spatial autocorrelation to provide weights. Uh, doing so, we're going to need to choose a parametric function for that spatial correlation. Uh, and we're going to get out of this a mechanism of estimating the interpolation error, which is a real key feature. Uh, so like I said, one of the key parts of of the um, of, of Krieging is this reliance on uh, this step of, of fitting a spatial correlation function. Now, here are some examples of, of spatial correlation functions that could be fit to variograms. Uh, you know, there's the simple exponential. So, you know, there's a, you know, you're starting at some nugget and you rise uh, exponentially towards some asymptote. Uh, there's some uh, kind of a Gaussian function where instead of uh, dropping off as a function of, you know, exponent of distance, we're now doing uh, distance squared. So it has a very, you know, uh, x squared sort of x squared and an exponent sort of pattern similar to the Gaussian distribution. Uh, there's this more complicated spherical function. Uh, there could be something as simple as a linear trend to an asymptote and a bunch of other things. Uh, that said, I think one thing that's important to know is that uh, not all functions that have the pattern of starting low and going up to a, an asymptote are actually valid spatial correlation functions. There are, there are some restrictions on what can be a spatial correlation functions and the restrictions are, are actually pretty complicated because they, they have involved proofs that um, that your spatial uh, correlation function will lead to a spatial covariance matrix that is positive definite and thus uh, invertible. Uh, and that proof is, is really non-trivial. Uh, you, know, you can look in, in more advanced spatial statistics textbooks about what those proofs are. But I will say, uh, in all honesty, my strong recommendation would just be to look at in spatial statistics books to look up different options uh, and choose among them rather than to uh, try to prove a new spatial autocorrelation function. Uh, it, it's really not worth the effort. Uh, it's much easier to just say, you know, if, if these four don't work, there's there's a bunch of others out there that have been proven uh, to be valid spatial autocorrelation functions. So, you know, uh, I, I showed a bunch of spatial autocorrelation functions on the last slide, and that kind of might lead you to think, well, how do I choose between them? Um, and I'll just say that, that our concepts of model selection uh, apply to this choice of spatial covariance function just as well as they choose to any other model fitting. So here's an example of a uh, um, fitting three alternative spatial correlation functions, uh, an exponential correlation, Gaussian and spherical. Here we're, we're displaying those on the, uh, in terms of their correlogram equivalence instead of their semi-variogram uh, variance. You know, as we talked about before, there's a direct analytical interchange between those two. Um, and here I fit those th three alternative uh, functions and I'm scoring them uh, by AIC and just now reporting you the delta AIC. So we're seeing that the exponential model uh, fits this uh, decay in spatial correlation best, uh, the spherical the second best, and the Gaussian in red uh, does the worst. So here we could use, uh, we could fit alternative models of spatial decay to the spatial correlogram or to the spatial variogram, and then uh, do model selection on that. And then uh, using so, some you know, functions that we'll go through shortly, uh, you can then do a spatial interpolation 
and this is the same spatial map that we've seen multiple times in this, this series of spatial lectures. But now here's the interpolation based on Krieging, uh, which you know in many ways looks very similar to our, our uh, quadratic smoother. Uh, you know, it's showing a little bit more nuance in the wiggles, but it's capturing uh, what we had seen before, which was you know high means in this area and, and low means in these in the, the bottom right corner and the upper left corner. Uh, and then importantly, I can also, uh, in this case, have added contours to represent uh, interpolation uncertainties, showing you know, kind of pockets of higher confidence around data and pockets of lower confidence as we move away from data. So the, you know, these areas here, 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 represent areas where we're less confident. And you know, up here is, highest contour uh, areas where we're particularly uncertain about what we're likely to encounter there, uh, or, or less certain. In this case, the data is never actually too sparse, but it's allowing you to say, uh, not only um, what am I predicting there, but how confident should I be in those predictions, which I think is a really, really valuable thing uh, to have in a spatial statistical method. So how do we do that? How do we produce that set of maps? So I'm gonna walk you through uh, the steps of, of involved in creaking to generate these spatial autocorrelations, which you know, if it wasn't clear already, I, I kind of would say is, is widely considered to basically be the best practice uh, for, for geos working with geospatial data um, is that we should be you know, doing our, our mapping and interpolation based on the, the actual correlation structure in the data. Uh, so step one in creaking is to fit that variance model. So as before, uh, we start by constructing uh, the correlogram so that we get those estimates of correlation. Uh, so we, have our, we pass in our data, we pass in our number of bins, we construct our, our correlogram and that is gonna spit out uh, these x bins and the correlation coefficients associated with those in the y direction. Uh, now to fit uh, those covariances functions, I'm just going to rely on uh, maximum likelihood here. So I'm going to construct uh, a likelihood function. So I have a, a negative sum of a normal likelihood on a log scale. Uh, my data is the correlations. Uh, my and, and my uh, model is this exponential covariance function that takes in uh, these distance spins and uh, a parameter, an autocorrelation parameter, uh, you know, very analogous to the, the row in the AR1 model. So it's, a, it's the scale of autocovariance. Auto -covariance. Uh, and then I need a second parameter, since this is the normal for the residual error. Um, cool. So here I'm going to rely on this built-in uh, function for exponential covariance. It's coming out of that R spatial package. And I'm just going to do a simple, simple Gaussian uh, maximum likelihood estimate of that exponential covariance function uh, to uh, what came out of the correlogram. And then I'm going to just numerically optimize that pass in some exponential function, pass in likelihood, get back uh, parameter estimates. So it's gonna give me back parameter one, which is the parameter for the exponential covariance function, and parameter two, which is the residual error in fitting that spatial covariance function. Okay, step two is to actually uh, create the surface. Um, so first, we need to uh, detrend the surface to, in a way that accounts for the spatial covariance. Uh, so when we remember when we just did a simple polynomial detrending, we use the uh, surf ls function. Here uh, to detrend in a creating mode, we're using the surf gls generalized least squares function. Uh, we're giving again the degree of the polynomial, but now we're also passing in. Uh, the exponential covariance function, you know, in, in, in a more general sense, we're passing in our spatial covariance function. Uh, so this is actually, a, you know, uh, 
a pointer to the function itself. Uh, we're passing in our data, and then we're passing in any additional parameters that this spatial covariance function needs. So in this case, it needs that first parameter from the uh, fit, which is the that correlation coefficient, uh, that spatial correlation coefficient. And then any other information that needs to be passed in. This function does take other additional optional things. Uh, and so that gives us uh, this Krieging object. So it gives us, you know, the, the polynomial uh, and, and then the, uh, the application of the exponential covariance function. Cool. So that's our Krieging op, uh, object. We then, to make predictions, uh, we use this PR map function to make predictions on a matrix, passing in that uh, Krieging object. And then uh, as we did before, when we were just doing the spatial smoothing, a bounding box in a grid resolution, and that gives us out predictions on a matrix that fills in that, uh, those dimensions at that resolution. And then, then I'm just going to use the image function uh, to make that to actually visualize uh, the, that matrix of predictions. Uh, and then analogous to the PR mat for predicting the mean, there's this SC mat, which predicts uh, the standard error uh, from a Krieging object onto a matrix. Uh, so it very exactly the same, takes the Krieging object, it takes the, uh, the bounding box and the grid resolution, and it gives us back uh, a matrix of standard errors. And when we visualized it before, I used the contour function to add contours onto that existing image. And the add equals true you know, adds those contours onto the existing image rather than drawing a new map of the contours. But you could easily have done, you could have easily drawn contours of the predictions or you know, images of both and just display them side by side. So there's lots of ways of visualizing this. Uh, but the key point is you get out a whole matrix, you know, basically a raster map of your means, and you get a whole raster map of your standard errors. Some additional things to think about uh, within Krieging, kind of taking things uh, to the next level. Uh, in addition to the assumption of uh, anisotropy that's built into uh, uh, Sorry, in addition to the assumption of stationarity that's built into uh, uh, time series models as a key assumption, which is the idea that the spatial covariance is the same in all locations. Um, there's also uh, an assumption in spatial models called isotropy. Uh, and that's the assumption that the spatial covariance is the same in all directions. And, and we didn't really have that concept in in time series because time series is a one-dimensional problem. So we, in, in a one-dimensional problem, you know, if, if your um, if your uh, spatial covariance only depends as a function of distance and doesn't depend on location, um, then you know there's no concept, there's no idea of anisotropy, which is that it could depend di differently in different directions. But in spatial data, you could imagine that you could have a process where it is stationary, the spatial covariance only depends on distance, not location, but it could also depend on direction. So like the spatial covariance, you say going north to south may be different than the spatial covariance going east to west. Um, ways of dealing with that, you know, would be to calculate and fit variograms uh, separately for different directions. So I might do north and south correlations and in one bin and east and west in another bin, or we divide this up into you know, eight cardinal directions or, or something like that. Uh, the, the disadvantage of that would be it increases the number of parameters we need to estimate, and uh, we end up with less data points uh, per bin as the bins get smaller because you're now dividing data up not just based on direction, uh, based on distance, but also based on direction. Uh, you could alternatively modify your spatial covariance function to account for direction. Uh, so you might have a, uh, you know, a, 
a row north-south versus a row east-west. Um, you could alternatively fit spatial covariance functions into different subdomains. So we could divide an overall spatial map into different subdomains, and I might fit different correlation functions in different subdomains. So the, the, the former really is accounting for uh, anisotropy, uh, the fact that uh, uh, covariance could depend on direction, uh, while the latter suggestion really is addressing stationarity, the idea that the covariance uh, is changing in different subdomains. So there's a few different flavors of Krieging out there. The, the, the most basic, simple Krieging uh, assumes that the data has already been detrended, so it has a mean of zero, and you're just Krieging uh, the residuals. Uh, in ordinary Krieging, you're assuming that there's some mean, uh, but it's unknown, so the Krieging estimates the mean of the data uh, in addition to estimating uh, the interpolation. In universal Krieging, there's uh, a very similar, but now we're uh, accounting for uh, a polynomial trend. And the last, which really gets us, starts transitioning us to the more general idea of, of spatial modeling, accounting for spatial autocovariance, the idea of co-Krieging, which is the inclusion of spatial co of uh, inclusion of covariates in addition to just uh, polynomial trends, uh, because you can imagine that you know you know, I might have, you know, some attribute on a landscape and, you know, there's a lot of spatial autocorrelation to that, but it might be that that spatial autocorrelation is related to some other uh, spatial attribute. So, you know, the topography or the soils or something like that. And so if I had accounted for that other spatial covariate, I might actually be explaining a lot of the spatial pattern I see and that in using those covariates actually makes a lot more sense than just saying, you know, that it's, you know, north, south, east, west that's explaining the pattern according to some polynomial. Um, and then kind of to really set us up for the transition from exploratory Krieging to actual spatial data modeling, uh, it's important to go over some of the limitations of Krieging. Uh, so the, the first one that, that is worth noting is that when we're doing Krieging, we're assuming that uh, variogram model is known. So we, we did it as a two-step process. We had one step where we fit the spatial variogram uh, and that gave us uh, you know, uh, parameters for that model and a residual error. Uh, and then we use that in the next step to make predictions. And when we use it in the next step, we dropped that residual error and we dropped uh, <clears throat> the fact that there is parameter uncertainty associated with that parameter. So the, the spatial uh, interpolation that we do in Krieging, where we get a standard error out of it, that, that, that standard error that we get out of it is just the interpolation uncertainty. It is ignoring uh, the parametric uncertainty in uh, the uh, the spatial covariance model and the fact that the spatial covariance model is imperfect. Um, so we have this problem that you know we're fitting the variogram model uh, separate from the overall model fit. Uh, it's not done part of fitting an overall model. It's it's done in two parts, and it's also worth noting that the the fitting of the the covariance function is not done on the data directly. It's actually done based on these binned means of n squared pairwise differences. <clears throat> so in some sense, your, your sample size uh, is inflated because you're now looking at n squared pairwise differences instead of n data points. Uh, but it's also somewhat arbitrary because you know uh, the power in your, uh, estimation is very sensitive to the number of bins you happen to choose. Um, so it's not actually using the actual distances between points, it's using this binning approach. Uh, so we have the, the separation of, of detrending and autocorrelation. Um, 
and and so we're, we're missing uncertainties we, we really can see that uh we should be doing everything all at once. We should be fitting the, the, air co the spatial error covariance matrix and accounting for its uncertainty and propagating it all at once. Um, the other thing that's notable about Krieging is it, it, you know, it, it's good if our goal is prediction, uh, but sometimes what we want is just to account for the spatial autocorrelation in our errors. So sometimes what we're interested in is the relationship between some X and some Y, and we just need to account for the fact that because those X's and Y's sh show up at specific spatial locations, they're, you know, they, they might be spatially autocorrelated. So similar to time series analysis, uh, traditional Krieging I think is good as an exploratory data analysis approach, uh, but ultimately what we want to do is move on to fitting uh, true spatial models we're fitting the whole model at once. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up uh, this, this section you know, on kind of traditional uh, approaches to, to Krieging, uh, and then we'll, we'll transition in the next lectures to actual spatial data models. Thanks.